Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third press conference today, which is on hazards in the wake of climate change. And I would like to remind everyone that uh, we'll be having the four presentations in a row, and then at the end, we'll open the floor for questions from journalists in the room or from those watching remotely. There are a few materials relating to this press conference available online at media.egu.eu slash documents, if you want to access that. So I'll introduce our speakers now. It's Gioacchino Roverti, who is a PhD student at the Université Clermont-Auvergne in France, and he's also affiliated with Simon Fraser University in Canada. Then we have Matthias Schlogel, who is a researcher at the Transportation Infrastructure Technologies at the Austrian Institute of Technology here in Vienna. Uh, our third speaker is Luis Samaniego, who is a deputy head of the Computational Hydro Systems Department at the UFZ Helmut Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig in Germany. And finally, we have Monika Barczykowska, who is a researcher with the Environmental Defense Funds in New York in the US. And I'll now hand over to our speakers. Yeah, thank you. Um, the idea I want to present is that landslide caused by deglaciation can cause volcanic eruption. Before uh, explaining, explaining you how, I would like to thank all the co-authors that help in the, the realization of this work. Uh, that is a um, collaborative effort between the University um, of clermont auvergne in France, Simon Fraser University, the University of Turin, and Thierry Altamira, a private company. How many of you know that there are volcanoes in Canada. Yes, there are volcanoes, and yes, they are a significant hazard. How many of you know the effect of climate change on volcanoes? Ice melting from the mountain removes support from slopes and can cause collapse. You can imagine, imagine the ice like some sort of protective layer. When the ice melts away, the mountain is free to collapse. Now, if your mountain is also a volcano, you have another problem because volcanoes are a pressurized system, and if you remove pressure by ice melting and landslide, you can have an eruption. Mount Meager is a glaciated volcano north of Vancouver, and in summer 2010, the largest landslide in Canadian history occurred here. We documented slope deformation and glacier retreat prior to the failure. You can see the blue line is the glacier outline, the red line is the collapse car, and the yellow line is the landslide path. The glacier at the base of the slope uh, retreated, and during the hottest part of the summer, the slope catastrophically failed. The whole mountain, you can see the Tour Eiffel at scale, started to move at very high velocity, running up the valley side, damming the river, and stopping very far from the source area. This event occurred when the ice melt was highest, and we see a correlation between high temperature, ice melting, and landslide. Uh, um, today's increase in temperature is likely to cause other large landslides. And at Meager, we see other peaks and slopes uh, with signs of deformation and retreating glacier at the toe. Plint Peak, for example, that you can see on the right side, has a lot of deformation. And on the glacier at the base, uh, during summer 2016, big fumarose ice cave formed. Fumaroles are hot volcanic gases steaming, and um, it's the first time that this happened there. So the equilibrium over the mountain is changing. To understand the effect of the decompression following landslide and ice melting on the volcano, we did numerical modeling, and we see that the change in pressure would go deep enough to affect the magmatic system. So landslide uh, can actually trigger volcanic eruption. And uh, in general, we can say that superficial processes such glacial retreat and landslide can have effect on the deep magmatic system. And so would be the opposite uh, that, for example, at Mont saint Helen, the famous eruption in the 80s, where an intru intrusion poked the surface and caused a landslide at Mont Meager would be the other way around, where a landslide would allow the magma to reach the surface through the decompression. And uh, we'll talk more about this in the PICO session tomorrow, and you might would like to check that out. And thank you.
All right, let's continue with landslides, but without volcanoes this time. My name is Matthias Schlögl. I'm a PhD student at the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences in Vienna, and I'm also a junior researcher at the Austrian Institute of Technology here in Vienna. Um, what I'd like today, what I'd like to present today is the topic of landslide exposure, especially with uh, focus on Europe's road and rail transportation infrastructure and how this exposure to landslides will uh, probably change along with climate change. Um, right at the beginning, of course, big thanks to my colleagues from the Austrian National Weather Service, Christoph Martin and Konrad Andre, who contributed in this study. All right, let's jump right into the, the issue. What you can see here in this picture is the high-level road and railway network in Central Europe. And all the roads and railway networks here are color-coded according to the um, expected or projected changes in heavy landslide events that are caused by uh, rainfall events in the time period 2071 to 2100. And all values depicted in this picture here are relative to the status quo, to the current climate conditions. So what you can see here is that, for instance, in the northern parts of Germany, we have these big green areas. We expect that nothing much will change in terms of heavy rainfall events that will trigger landslides in this area. But if you take a, a closer look in the areas south of Germany, in Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, France, and also in Austria, in the Alpine Foreland, you can see that we expect um, up to approximately 10 additional rainfall events in these areas that may trigger landslides, um, for instance, here in the, in the Alpine Foreland or in the Bavarian pre-Alps. And what you can see here is that the areas affected by these um, darker colors, by red and, and yellow, are also areas where landslides are really common nowadays because you have um, certain topography here and also geology um, that kind of fosters landslides in these areas as opposed to, for instance, in the Netherlands, where there are different hazards that are, of course, affecting the population there. So what's the motivation behind this study? I found a quite recent uh, newspaper article that, in my point of view, really is a nice illustration why this is important. Of course, to put it bluntly, landslides blocking any type of transportation infrastructure network uh, is never a fun thing to have. And in particular, what we uh, the situation we had here was on the 24th of December 2017, where a large landslide uh, completely cut off a village with about 150 inhabitants um, in the federal state of Tyrol here in Austria. So we can see that landslides are really an important issue today, and we expect that climate change, in particular changes in rainfall patterns and also changes in temperature, will increase uh, and will furthermore affect the slope stability um, and thus trigger additional rainfall uh, landslide events in the future. And something we have to, to keep in mind always is that this is not only related to the pure infrastructure damage, so to the pure damage these landslides cause to the infrastructure, but we also have to think about secondary costs, like for instance detour times, um, effects on the economy in terms of, uh, for instance, logistics companies or stuff like that, where not only the, the infrastructure itself is affected and damage occurs to the assets themselves, but also to the population in a broader context. Um, I quickly tried to break down the approach we employed in this study, um, and I'll just skim through it very quickly. So what we did here is actually quite a straightforward approach. We took um, the business as usual A1B scenario from, um, from the future emission scenarios proposed by the special uh, report on emission scenarios by the IPCC. So we took this business as usual scenario, then a couple of climate model runs was employed. These are called an ensemble, so you do not only do one run, but multiple runs um, together to obtain a more robust estimate or a broader bandwidth of future climate conditions. From these 
climate model runs from this ensemble, we extracted the so-called climate index, which is supposed to um, illustrate the these heavy rainfall events that may trigger landslides in, in Central Europe. And all the results were then gridded across our target area in Central Europe. So we had a gridded data set of um, this climate index depiction rainfall events. And in the last step, this gridded data set was concatenated with the road network and the rail network to obtain these projections at the road network level. Finally, the last point I'd like to mention is how can we assess the impact of such interruptions on the local population? So this is a, a topic that is slightly different, but a little bit more applied in this case. Um, in a very recent study, we had a closer look at the Austrian province of Vorarlberg, the westernmost federal state of Austria, and we identified a number of risky or critical road sections in this area. And what we did here is that we took an open street map road graph and simply took out 12 incident sites where landslides might occur on this road network. And afterwards, we compared the, we call it baseline scenario in an uninterrupted state. So how would the population route um, the daily trips they have to take, for instance, to um, commuters or, for instance, to buy foods at the local grocery store. And we compared this baseline scenario to the alternative routes, evasion routes they had to take in case of landslide events where these elements were removed from the road network. And we found that in extreme cases, um, there were really severe impacts on the local population in terms of detour time and detour um, length they had to take. So there were up to uh, about 100 kilometers detour in certain areas where there were no alternative routes available, where simply the only road in this area was blocked and people really had to take a wide berth around this area. And this results, what you can see here on the, on the right hand side in these box plots, of relative evasion lengths of up to 500%. So it took them um, five times the time um, to reach the destination compared to the baseline scenario. All right. I've listed two references of recent papers here. And in case you have any questions, feel free to ask afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to clarify that this presentation will be not about soil moisture droughts as originally appearing in the in the release, because the paper which is based on this soil moisture has now under embargo in nature, nature climate change. Instead of that, I'm going to present um, another paper from the same project that deals with hydrological droughts. This project was uh, basically car carried out for a consortium coordinated by CEH and United Kingdom. And, uh, and the coordination from and the modeling from U, uh, UFZ. Princeton University and Utrecht were part uh, collaborators. Um, probably you have seen and heard about the consequences of hydrological droughts. Here's just a summary of what happened in 2003 and um, heat wave and drought event in Europe. Minus 6.6% .6 of hydropower went down, 4.7% of thermoelectric power generation simply could not be realized because of low flows. And, and in generally, in this year, about 8.7 million euros were um, um, lost because of these uh, low flow conditions in, in rivers. And generally, economic losses due to droughts um, had been doubled in the period 76 to 9,000, according to um, the DG Europe. And we normally have, from, since 2009, 2006, about 6.2 billion per year are lost. Water quality are another pro big problem. We know at the moment that about 7% of the rivers in Europe are polluted, and heat and droughts will make this problem even worse. If you have been following the, 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 the drought in Spain, and that's just an example, we can see that in the last year, 
basically all dams and river basins in, in, in Spain were under severe stress because of a shortage of rainfall. Because of this, CO2 emissions also rise about 37% with respect to the previous years, which is uh, against reversing the, the, the what you want to do with vegetation, helping to capture CO2. And the uh, Institute of Meteorology in Spain calculated that it was a deficit of 15 liters per square meter. So this is an enormous amount of water and they were considering that it's probably one of the worst droughts since 52 years and some people even consider that it's probably the worst in 100. That's what happened up to now. Now I will open for you another, another scenario. What would happen now if we continue as global, as business as usual? What happened if we continue is uh, what uh, the IPCC wants to know, Paris Agreement uh, recommended to investigate the sensitivity according to increased global warming for different degrees of warming, especially what would happen if we don't achieve 1.5 degree warming. So we tackle this problem in this project edge, um, especially we want to know what's the magnitude and the robustness, so to quantify the uncertainty of the signals of change in low flows, as you can see here in this, in this dam in Portugal, um, for Europe under different conditions. We have scenarios from climate models, so we could estimate this. And basically also to in investigate how robust, uh, robust are these projected low flows according to these warming levels. This is the setting where we started. So we, we congregate a number, a number of institutes um, that have expertise in hydrological modeling, and we have made these unprecedented simulations and over Europe at a very high resolution. Such a product didn't exist before. It covers Europe in five kilometers from 51 till 2005 in historical records to verify the, the results. We also got the projections till the end of the century and we used the, the reference period to compare the changes with respect to the 72,000 period. The, one of the key Problem, key features of this model was that all models were set up with the same input information, soil maps and digital, digital elevation models to minimize uncertainties. And that's also a feature that not most uh, programs and on, on research programs can afford. We call it a seamless parameterization of all land surface models, which in this case were NOAA NP, MHM, an in-house model from UFZ, PCR Globe, and um, um, another model from um, Utrecht University and NOAA NP, which is a land surface model from the American Weather Service. So in total, we have a huge ensemble. It's also different, a new highlight. 45 members based on, on, on five CIMIP-5 GCMs. So it's, GCM is the coupled model intercomparison project. And the three warming scenarios which are called the representative concentration pathways that recommended by IPCC. Given this information, we calculate what would be the future world and, and the, the results were very astonishing. Even by 1.5 degree warming compared to the reference period, we already have a 12% decrease in the south of Europe and, and a positive signal on the north in the Alpine north and Scandinavia because of changes in precipitation and temperature, basically. So even if we really make a lot of effort, we already have problems. The signal, what you see here, the robustness tells you how strong is the signal. You see that you are in the middle range, so this means that the models are not really uh, still uh, coinciding. If you are close to 100, means that the signal is very clear. There is almost no uncertainty. All models are telling you increase or decrease. If we got to a two degree, which is probably not even reached by current state, the thing already changed dramatically, but we cannot distinguish statistically the difference between these two goals. And if we got to a three degree world, the consequences will be terrible for the south of Europe. And that implies that we need to do enormous effort in adaptation and, and control. And that is the message of this talk. Thank you.
So he hello everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, so my name is Monika Barcikowska and I'm working in Environmental Defense Fund. And today I will be talking about near-term future changes in the winter weather extremes projected over the Euro-Atlantic region. And here we focus uh, on changes associated with global warming at the two temperature levels uh, specified by the Paris Agreement, namely 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. So, and here I'm going to show that this additional half a degree warming actually makes a difference for the regional weather. And this, for example, includes an intensification of storminess together with stronger extreme winds and extreme precipitation, mostly over Northeast Atlantic and Northern Europe. So to put it briefly into context, uh, I will remind that most of winter weather extremes in the Euro-Atlantic region is associated with extratropical storms. And these storms are very often accompanied by severe winds and intense precipitation, which may often lead uh, to flooding or storm surges. Mm, so basically they pose a serious risk for health in transport infra infrastructure industry. And here we would like to learn whether this risk will change in any significant way with the additional half degree warming. And it's also important to acknowledge the fact that typical CMIP generation experiments till now were not really designed to address the specific climate policy temperature goals. Also, horizontal resolution of typical CMIP models is often too coarse, which may severely bias the representation of storms and associated extremes. Therefore, here we are using a, a different type of experiment, and we call it half a, deg half a degree additional warming prognosis and projected impacts, so-called HEPI. And we use HEPI because it does address the specific climate policy temperature goals, which means 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius warming compared to pre-industrial times. And also it provides high resolution runs in space and time, which remarkably improves reliability of simulations. So here I'm showing uh, briefly our results. Mm, so first of all, I'm showing here future response, so future changes in the winter weather extremes with the additional half a degree warming. So first of all, we found statistically significant changes in large scale circulation, storminess, and extreme winds and extreme precipitation, as I said, mostly over uh, Northeast Atlantic and Northern Europe. So how to explain it? So when we look at this picture, we, s we can compare um, a mean sea level pressure for the present climate, which is marked with contours here, with the future response, future changes which are shaded. So this comparison clearly indicates a strong northeastward shift of the atmospheric circulation over Atlantic and associated with this strengthening and shift of mid-latitude westerly winds, which are marked with arrows. And we see that uh, these winds mostly intensify over northeast uh, Atlantic, between British Isles and Iceland, and, and over Norwegian Sea and, and Scandinavia. And no surprise that in the same regions, we see uh, the largest increase in extreme winds, extreme precipitation, and storminess. So how much they intensify? Uh, here we focus on three hourly precipitation extremes or three hourly precipitation events, which are so intense that they statistically, statistically occur once per 10 years. Therefore, we call them 10 year events. So we see here that with the additional half a degree warming, these uh, events will severely, the severity of these events will radically increase. And not only over Atlantic, like here, but also over the northwest coast of British Isles and Scandinavia. And why these regions? Because these regions are mostly exposed to the Atlantic storms, which are coming from this region. And so how much they intensify? So intensity of these events may increase um, over the northwest coast by 5 millimeters per day, which means sometimes by 20%. Changes of the coast, like for example, we, we see here interior Scandinavia, are usually smaller because they are less exposed 
to upcoming uh, storms and moisture. And um, still they may increase up to 10 or 20 percent. I might remind that storms are very important because they transport towards Europe moisture and wind. Therefore, these um, northern parts of uh, Europe are mostly exposed to the wind and uh, precipitation, which is associated with these storms, right? Uh, at the same time, we also see a strong increase in extreme winds. And for these winds, we also um, found that 10-year extreme wind events may increase, again, over Northeast Atlantic and Northern Europe, sometimes up to two meters per second, especially over British Isles and North Sea. And two meters per second is more than seven kilometers per hour, so these values are non negligible either for coastal infrastructures or offshore wind farms. And finally, we see that actually we can explain most of these changes in intensification of extreme winds with changes in storminess, which is here shaded. So we see that in the future, as storminess will be intensifying again on its polar flanks of its, its climatology, which means over Northeast Atlantic and also storminess impacts will be shifting towards north or extending towards northeast, so towards Scandinavia. So these changes actually can explain mostly of the uh, intensifying extremes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions. Are there any questions either from the journalists here in the room or from the chat? Hi, my name is Daisy Dunn. I'm from a website called Carbon Brief. Um, my question is for you, Matthias. Matthias, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, yeah. So you used a business as usual scenario for your yeah. study, is that right? Did you also look at any more moderate emission scenarios? No, just this one. Um, Would you expect there to be a difference in results if you did? Yeah, I guess so. I would assume that um, if we were really able to, you know, somehow alleviate the uh, emission of, of um, carbon dioxide and, and uh, other emissions to the atmosphere, I would think that this might slightly reduce the exposure to these um, landslide-inducing rainfall events. But I'm really not sure on, on the extent, though. So it's everything's a projection. So it's you have to keep in mind the uncertainty. Everything we're talking here about is is affiliated with. So I would expect the slides decrease probably, but I'm not. I do not dare to you know quantify the the extent of the reduction. Hi there, uh, Andy Coghlan, new scientist. Um, uh, Giacchino, <laughs> I didn't know there were any um, v volcanoes in um, Canada, but I do now. Um, I was going to say, uh, which other areas of the world do you think this effect that you've seen um, might materialise in? I mean, we, we, we found out last year, for example, that there were these volcanoes underneath Antarctica that we didn't even know exist existed before but it sounds like the the snow uh, the, the ice above is keeping them you know uh, under control so if it starts to disappear could they start to blow for example and are there any others anywhere else that you already know about which um, are kind of well could go the same way yeah uh, following the pacific ring of fire you go north of from British Columbia, you go to Alaska, there are volcanoes there with glacier. And then you go down to Kamchatka in Russia, you have volcanoes with glacier as well. And if you go the other way around, you have volcanoes with glacier in Peru or Chile, in the Andes. And then you also have uh, Iceland, but then that's a different type of volcanism. But they see relation between glacier and volcanism and decompression. Any comment on the Antarctic? Uh, it's a different scale problem because I'm looking at alpine glacier rather than a big ice sheet. 
but then for sure there will be some effect. Uh, especially in that case where you have kilometers of ice, you would expect um, deeper decompression. And so you may, in, in my case, you have a, you, do, you wouldn't have a partial melting following decompression for lens, like you would have maybe bubble nucleation and then eruption of some magmatic body in a shallow, uh, at a shallow level. But then instead, if you melt kilometers of ice, you might have deeper decompression and have partial melting at deeper level. Are there any additional questions? If not, we'll finish here. You are welcome to approach our speakers. We have four interview rooms available on the side, which you can book just at the desk outside. And I'd like to thank you all very much for coming and thank you for your contributions. And our next press conference will come up in less than half an hour and it's on the latest results from NASA's mission Juno at Jupiter. Thank you.